Cigarettes are the most lethal consumer product on the planet. Every year, more than five million customers of the tobacco industry die. These are people who know that their success can be measured in millions of deaths. The more successful they are, the more people will die. In this series, we investigate how thousands of young people around the world are still taking up smoking every day. And recently, the numbers of 25 to 34-year-old smokers in the UK has increased. The reality is the vast majority of smokers start smoking as children. We see how powerful cigarette companies manipulate smokers and seduce the young, potential victims of the fatal addiction. They need children to start smoking to replace the smokers that they lose. We look at the industry's fight against increasing regulation and its last-ditch battle to prevent plain packaging, with gruesome health warnings replacing glossy images. We want to protect the next generation from the terrible consequence of smoking cigarettes. We travel to Australia, where the industry fought a ferocious battle against plain packaging to protect its last vital marketing tool. It was feral, it was ferocious, they threw everything at it. For an industry under constant attack, it's in remarkable health. With eye-watering profits of more than 30 billion pounds a year, the industry would appear to be winning. It's an extraordinary amount of money for an industry that was worth a tiny fraction of that 20 years ago, and an industry that seemingly has been under threat for the last 50 years. I've spent 40 years investigating how, in the past, the industry has dissembled and lied. But now we've been allowed inside the second largest tobacco company in the world, British American Tobacco, to talk to its directors. I think that the future is about tobacco harm reduction. It's about providing a range of alternative nicotine products to consumers. So we are indeed the problem. That is no reason for us not to be part of the solution. Who finally wins the decisive battle over plain packaging has still to be decided. We're talking about young people and children, and we have a duty of care to our young people. Everyone knows that smoking kills, so why are young people still taking it up? I wondered what makes these teenagers leave the warmth of their classroom. It's too cold. Is the cigarette your friend on a bitterly cold, stormy day like this? It's horrible coming out in the wind and the weather and everything to have a smoke, but you need to do it though, don't you? So. What's it like when you take your first drag? When you're stressed, it's oh, pretty it's nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's oh, yeah. But when you wake up in the morning, it's quite horrible. It, take, it tastes disgusting when you wake up. Mm. But... Well, you come out here because you want a cigarette. Why do you want a cigarette? Um, just you need, urge, and you yeah. need one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you need one. College is stressful, so yeah. <laughs> Very stressful. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you need them more and more. These three British teenagers started smoking when they were 12 and 15. Girls are now just as likely to smoke as boys. The reality is the vast majority of smokers start smoking as children before the age of 18. And the products that are appealing to young adult smokers that are glossy and attractive are also very appealing to young teenagers. The tobacco industry insists it does not target children. But in the UK, there's a staggering statistic. Every year, 200,000 children aged between 11 and 15 start smoking. And they need children to start smoking to replace the smokers that they lose. Smokers can't fail to be aware of the health risks. They scream out from every packet. They're like pariahs with fewer and fewer places where they can light up. Overall, the habit is slowly declining in the UK, but still around one in five adults smoke, as do many celebs. And smoking among 20 to 34-year-olds has actually increased in the last few years.
Despite constant attacks by the anti-tobacco lobby and government restrictions, the tobacco industry, unlike some of its customers, shows no sign of dying. When you've got a highly addictive product used by a very large number of people, it's a license to print money. Every year, the tobacco industry sells around six trillion cigarettes. British American Tobacco, BAT, manufactures 700 billion cigarettes annually. Its biggest factory is here in Germany. What first hits you when you enter the factory, apart from the noise and the smell of tobacco, is its sheer size and scale. These machines are churning out around 200 million cigarettes a day. It's really quite staggering. The industry's profits are even more staggering. It makes a great deal of money. The estimate for 2012 is that retail sales for the entire industry were almost three quarters of a trillion dollars. And then the manufacturer profit from that is going to be north of $50 billion. Ironically, nearly everyone's future is invested in tobacco. Pension funds are addicted to it. And government is addicted too. In the UK, tobacco taxes bring in nearly twice the direct cost to the National Health Service of treating smoking-related diseases. Tobacco remains the darling of the city. It's held on to that position despite the premature deaths of millions and decades of attacks from governments and critics. British American Tobacco was the only tobacco company that opened its doors to us. BAT is in the London Stock Exchange's top 10. It makes no apology for what it does. We're running a successful business. Uh, it's a well-governed international business. It's a legal business. We have a legitimate right to operate. Isn't the paradox that your profits continue to increase despite everything that the government and the anti-tobacco lobby has done to try and curb your activities? Well, we make profits and increase our profits because we also are responsive to the demands of our shareholders. And remember, at the same time that we may have increased our share price and our profits, governments have also increased their excise take substantially. In fact, we pay something like £30 billion worth of excise to exchequers all over the world. So why, despite all the increasing regulations, are so many people still smoking? Most people start before they are 18, almost half, even before they're 60. With our three teenage smokers now back in the warmth, I wanted to know why they smoke. Uh, Molly, why did you start? All of my friends smoked, so I was like, a bit left out. I had to stay inside while they smoked and stuff, so it like, came social. Do you think it's cool to smoke? I did at the start. I was like, oh, God, I've got a cigarette. <laughs> I'm cool. <laughs> so I started socially smoking, and it just got more and more, and you found that, you know, when you did have a drink and stuff, yeah. you enjoyed a cigarette. Ian, aren't you concerned about your health? You started smoking when you were 12. You're now smoking between 10 and 20 a day. I never thought about it, really. I'm always trying to keep healthy and stuff. Aren't you worried about getting lung cancer, heart yeah, disease, yeah, in bronchitis yeah, yeah. in a... Quite a few years' time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but mm. it's not going to happen to you. I, I hope not. Anyway, mm. but no. you think, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Mm. There's so many people out there smoking. Why is it going to be me? But I guess it always could be you, couldn't it? Because you're doing so the exact same thing as them. Diane and John Marshall also started smoking in their teens. Yeah. That was in black and white, so it must have been 1963. <laughs> a lifetime of smoking has taken a dreadful toll on both. That's me, look, smoking. And you wish you'd never had it? I know, I do. I should have stopped smoking before, anyway. We both should. Diane started smoking in the 1960s, when she was 19. I just wanted to be the same as everybody else. Try and see what it was like. I enjoyed it, so I was carry on smoking. How old were you when you started smoking, John? 14. 
John used to be a long distance lorry driver and he rolled his own. How many did you go on to smoke? <laughs> 100 a day when I was driving. 100 a day? 100 a day when I was driving. Well, I loved it. It was just something to do. I really enjoyed it. Did you ever worry about what your smoking 100 cigarettes a day might be doing to you? I did. I only heard what everybody else said, like, you know, they'll kill you in the end. I believe them now. After the Second World War, Britain became a smoker's paradise. Three out of four men were puffing away, and women were becoming addicted too. There was a time when you could smoke anytime, anywhere, and everywhere. On trains. On buses on planes and in offices. Cigarettes were glamorous, but the legacy was anything but an awesome toll of death and disease. <whistles> what has smoking done to you? Knackered me. Short of breath, <laughs> angina. Everything. You are everything, aren't you? If I'd have known, I would have packed up a long, long while ago. I wished I'd never, ever even seen a cigarette. The amount of trouble I've had. Who do you blame? It's myself, isn't it? Can only blame myself. John suffers from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, and he has a heart condition too. Diane was diagnosed 13 years ago with a virulent form of lung cancer. She was given a year and a half to live. What was your reaction when you were told that you had lung cancer? I didn't really know what to say or what to do. I just wanted to go in a room on my own and scream. Well, it can't be me. It can't have happened to me. But I still carried on smoking. You carried on smoking? Yeah. After you've been diagnosed with lung cancer? Yeah. Why? Because I like the skirt, that right. And today? Mm. Diagnosed with it again, I think. Sadly, it's now been confirmed that Diane has lung cancer again, and she's undergone radiotherapy. Every day, her consultant at Nottingham University Hospital sees patients who are victims of the world's biggest preventable cause of death and disease. And that coughing that you had a minute ago, yeah. was that hurting your chest when you did that? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What does it feel like? Like a knife in me, you know, when we breathe. Yeah, yeah. The biggest killers in the UK are lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart disease, so these, these are, are all smoking related. And they're the common things. We've also got lots of other cancers, for example, throat cancer smoking related, uh, and then things like uh, peripheral vascular disease, which is where the arteries in your legs fur up uh, with atheroma, and they block off, and you can, you can lose your legs. Now, this is the left upper lobe of... Nearly 40 years ago, the message from doctors was the same. Cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. This is a cigarette smoker's lung. Statistics mean people, and here they are. Buckets and buckets. This is the work of the hospital. Buckets and buckets of lung cancer. And all these would have been preventable. All these would have been preventable. When I was first making documentaries about smoking in the 1970s, this was my Bible, the report of the Royal College of Physicians of 1962. It said that smoking is a cause of lung cancer, bronchitis, and probably heart disease. It went on to say that around 50,000 people every year in this country die from these smoking-related diseases. Today, that number 
has doubled. The Royal College of Physicians' current expert on smoking is also a consultant at the same hospital, treating the victims of smoking every day. Those people lose an average of 10 years of life, healthy life. That is a huge toll of entirely avoidable disability and death. But that disability is now concentrated down in the poorest and most disadvantaged in society. The very most neglected and uh, marginalized from our society are where the smoking is now happening. It's in areas like this part of central England, only a few miles from the hospital, that smoking rates are highest. How would you describe this area? Well, this, this is a mixed uh, council estate. It's one of the most deprived areas in Derbyshire. And what are the smoking rates here? Well, about 50% of the adult population there's these pockets of, of, of deprivation and, and linked in with that deprivation are these high levels of smoking. And it's sucking a large amount of the you know, little money they have out of these areas. For decades, the industry told barefaced lies about the growing medical evidence. They were exposed when tobacco's senior executives gave evidence before the United States Congress. If you raise your right hand, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah. Well, the chief executives of the world's major tobacco companies stood up in front of Congress and basically lied about the addictiveness and harm of their products. Yes or no, do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive. And they lied knowing that they were lying. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And deliberately, I think, misleading people. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. It's a long journey back from making that kind of statement publicly to being trusted and respected by the public, and especially the public health community. Such attempts to conceal the truth also had a profound effect on the lives of millions and, ironically, those who worked in the industry, too. Brian Jackson started his first job in the 70s when he joined Gallagher's, the makers of Benson and Hedges in the UK, and Silk Cut. So the first day I joined him, sat around the meeting table, and we have a sales training manager at the end, and he pushes in front of each one of us a 200-pack of Silk Cut. I pushed them away and said, I'm sorry, I don't smoke. And he said, Brian, he said, you can't work for us if you don't smoke. So I have the cigarettes. Um, so that's how I started smoking. So within no time at all, I'm smoking 50 to 60 cigarettes a day. Brian Jackson used to start his day with a cigarette. He now starts it with an endless cocktail of drugs he needs just to be able to breathe. Brian has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the result of a lifetime of smoking. My daughter, from the age of about five or six, used to say to me, oh, Daddy, I wish you wouldn't smoke. And she came home one day and she said, Daddy, I don't want you to die. But even, even being told that by a five to six year old child doesn't necessarily, to a hardened smoker, have any effect. Brian had become a habitual smoker by 1980, the year I went to Brazil and interviewed BAT's local director. Do you believe that cigarette smoking is harmful to health? As you know, I'm not a medical man and therefore I cannot offer a medical opinion, I would be incompetent to offer a medical opinion on that question. Are you saying you don't know? That is exactly what I'm saying. Today, British American tobacco has a very different view. Do you believe that cigarette smoking is harmful to health? Absolutely, and uh, British American tobacco is clear about that. Why did you deny it for so many years? Well, I can't speak about the past. I'd like to talk about now. Well, I... no, no, the past... One of your issues is trust. The reason why your industry is not trusted 
is because it lied about the medical evidence for so many years. The point is that that was then and this is now. I prefer to talk about now and the future. But you're, you're evading my question. Until you accept that, why should people believe what you say now? Well, I think the key moment was the day that we came out and we admitted the link between smoking and health. And what I am most interested in is plotting a pathway for this business over the next decades, over the next hundred years. For decades, cancer was the forbidden word in BAT's research labs in the south of England. The killer disease went by the secret code name Zephyr. BAT's current scientific director speaks a different language. Hard truth has replaced deception and lies. So this is a chart which lays out the hundred known toxicants in cigarette smoke. You're inhaling them into your lung and that's why smoking uh, presents such a risk to health. Which are the carcinogens in that? Top so the carcinogens would be substances like benzopyrene. There are things like cadmium, lead and mercury. It's unprecedented that a tobacco company now makes such a frank admission on television. Cigarette smoking is a cause of real and serious diseases. Cancer, particularly cancer of the lung, heart disease, so stroke and heart attack, and respiratory disease such as bronchitis and emphysema. And for a lifetime smoker, about half of them can expect to die prematurely as a result of their cigarette smoking. And nine of which... The industry has changed but only after decades of unrelenting pressure that has severely restricted their ability to market its product. Advertising has always been the engine that drives cigarette sales, associating the product with anything but their lethal reality. Looking back, there was a time half a century ago when Piccadilly Circus was lit up with cigarettes. For many years, advertising, promotion and sponsorship were the industry's seductive weapon to associate smoking with something that was desirable, glamorous and sexy. But those days are now long gone, as governments have turned the screw tighter and tighter on tobacco. In the 60s, advertising cigarettes on TV was banned in the UK, as in much of the Western world. In the 70s, the British government introduced health warnings on packs. In the last 20 years, the battle has intensified. Most forms of tobacco advertising in print and on billboards were prohibited. Sponsorship of sporting and cultural events was banned. Smoking was forbidden in offices, restaurants, pubs and all enclosed public places. And bigger warnings with gruesome pictures were put on cigarette packs. Every one of these measures was fiercely contested by the tobacco industry. The cigarette companies, I think they've long seen themselves as being in a form of trench warfare that you, you fight as long as you can in the trench you're in before you retreat to the next trench to, because you know that they're simply going to keep coming at you. Despite all these restrictions, the industry has continued to thrive. But now it faces its biggest battle in decades to avoid being stripped of its last vestige of marketing, with glossy branded packs being replaced with plain or standardized packs. That battle started in 2010. Australia has the most stringent anti-smoking legislation of any country anywhere in the world. But it's only the result of a long and fierce battle with the tobacco industry. I've come to Australia to see how the latest battle over plain packaging was fought and won. This is Picture Postcard Australia. Sun, sea, sand and surf the healthy outdoor life on smoke-free Bondi Beach. These children aged between 12 and 14 are training to be Bondi Beach's next generation lifesavers. Any of them smokers? No. Any of them likely smokers? No. Why do you say that? I think they've grown up in a culture of anti-smoking. They just wouldn't even dream of it. I couldn't name one person in the club that smokes actually. Smokers in Australia are now an ostracised minority. In 2012, glossy packages were consigned to the dustbin of history. 
Go into any newsagents and you'll find cigarettes hidden away behind closed doors. Few have seen the change more closely than those who sell cigarettes, people like Gerard Munday, who runs a convenience store in Melbourne. Shows in the cabinet, yeah. And as you can see, it's all pretty dull and boring. That's the intention, isn't it? That's the, that's the intention, I think, yes. When you see it like that as a, as a display, it's quite confronting. So do you prefer damages your gums and teeth to peripheral vascular Correct. disease? You, you pick. Which one would you like? <laughs> I, think I'll, I think I'll give it a pass. Yeah, yes. yeah. As you may know, cigarettes have been linked to cancer, addiction, emphysema, heart disease and premature death. And as a result, we at My Tobacco Company are introducing a total product recall. All of our product will be withdrawn from sale wherever it is in Australia until we can guarantee that it poses absolutely no threat to your health. Because if there's one thing we care about here, it's your health. <laughs> the Cancer Council of Victoria was one of those who led the charge for plain packaging. Well, this is the Marlborough brand, and this is... Professor Melanie Wakefield provided the crucial data for the legislation and is now doing a follow-up study for the Australian government. Uh, in 1995 in Australia, but this is how they are now under plain packaging. The plain packs are specifically designed to be as unattractive as possible. The main purpose of plain packaging is to encourage young people not to start smoking, to avoid taking it up. Plain packaging has been a crushing blow the industry desperately tried to kill the legislation. It was feral, it was ferocious. This was the fiercest reaction from the tobacco industry to anything that I've seen in about 40 years of work on tobacco. They threw everything at it. The health minister who proposed the legislation was targeted in TV ads. What did they say about you? Oh. All the normal sort of nanny state, nanny Nicola, um, over-regulation, all those sorts of arguments. It seems clear to me that there weren't many mothers around. Nannies are fundamentally a good thing <laughs> in my world. And if that's the worst that someone's going to say about my time in politics, I'm absolutely happy to wear that as a badge of honour. BAT claims plain packaging in Australia has been a failure, just as they had predicted. Plain packaging hasn't had an impact in increasing the amount of people uh, uh, quitting smoking. The real point was to deter young people between the ages of, say, 12, 15, 16, to take up smoking. That was the purpose of the legislation. Initially, it was to stop people smoking, and they kept moving the goalpost as they went through the process. And as it became apparent that plain packaging wasn't working, the goalpost shifted. I think the early signs are that things are working the way we intend and that most of the tobacco companies' claims are not turning out to be, um, but be based on evidence. In England and Wales, the battle over plain packaging has been even more politically contentious. And it's not over yet. At first, the government was in favour of plain packaging. But then it did a U-turn after intense lobbying by the industry and its supporters. The Prime Minister was accused of caving in and being lobbied by his election strategist, the Australian Linton Crosby. Linton Crosby's agency has listed BAT and Philip Morris among its clients. Mr Crosby was accused of abusing his privileged position to promote the industry's case. Did you ever lobby the Prime Minister on tobacco, Linton? The Prime Minister's said everything that needs to be said on that issue. He's never lobbied me on anything. Mr Speaker, he is the Prime Minister for Benson and Hedge Funds and he knows it. Can he see there is a devastating conflict of interest between having your key advisor raking it in from big tobacco and then advising you not to go ahead with plain packaging? In the end, Mr Crosby publicly denied there had been any lobbying or even any conversation with the Prime Minister about plain packaging. Then the government did yet another U-turn and appointed the paediatrician, Professor Sir Cyril Chantler, to review the evidence. He recommended the government should introduce plain packaging. 
most people who smoke as adults started when they were children and were absolutely addicted by the time they were 25. There is evidence that young people are particularly susceptible to addiction. So if you can encourage young people not to start, then you will reduce the suffering and the premature deaths and the huge cost that this imposes to our National Health Service, which, of course, we all pay for. This was one of more than 50 studies that pointed in the same direction. And stay really still. So we're going to track your eye movements while you look at a whole different range of cigarette packs. This eye-tracking trial established that young non-smokers paid more attention to health warnings when branding is removed. Towards the health warning, it kept their attention down here. A 2% reduction in the 200,000 or so young people who start smoking each year would be 4,000 young people not starting smoke each year, which, of course, would translate eventually into a huge saving in terms of lives. Now, the government is minded to legislate, but only after yet more consultation. Scotland has already said it will go ahead. There is no evidence that plain packaging will reduce the rates of youth, uh, youth uptake of smoking. There are all sorts of reasons why children may or may not start smoking. Our packaging is designed as a marketing lever to be competitive to encourage uh, consumers who have chosen to smoke to switch from a competitor's product to ours. That's a BOT product. Who's that designed to appeal to? This is designed to appeal to adult smokers. This is not designed to appeal to children. That packet says glamour. It's called Vogue. And the point that Cicero makes is that children inevitably are affected by the image that that packet and similar packets portray. Sir Cyril Chantler states in his report quite clearly that there are limitations with the evidence that he's found with regard to plain packaging. And the debate is far from over. As children lie at its heart, I went to a school in the northwest of England to see what a group of 11 and 12 year olds think about current and plain cigarette packs. The session was organized by a campaigner from Tobacco Free Futures. Yeah, it's like really shiny, so like people think it's like new and like it's like a new way of opening and it's got like a nice box. It's golden here as well inside. And there's different colours of them. Well that one's a bright packet and it sort of like drags you in and makes you wanna smoke them because they're bright and colourful and it's like you just wanna fit in to like all your friends. Certainly the children I met thought plain packaging would work. I think it will decrease how many are sold because it's a lot more plain, a lot more like, tells you a lot more how dangerous it is. I think it will decrease the people um, that start to smoke at a young age because they won't want to smoke because of the horrible packets and if they read them then they know it's really bad for them and it's not all fancy and stuff. But one of the UK's closest neighbours is already committed to introduce plain packaging and that's Ireland. Once Irish pubs were synonymous with smoking, but Ireland has led the way in bringing in a range of tough anti-smoking legislation. I remember coming into pubs like this and walking into a thick fug of cigarette smoke. Of course, all that has now changed since Ireland introduced a ban on smoking in public places, and that was 10 years ago and Ireland was the first country in the world to do so. The air is much sweeter now. Every anti-smoking measure has been implacably opposed by the industry. This mountain of postcards is a rare glimpse of the scale of its lobbying, all sent to oppose a draft European proposal on tobacco. We received about 10,000 submissions. 97% of them were, I believe, from the tobacco industry. Uh, it was a clearly coordinated, concerted campaign. And of course, the idea here again is, is to obfuscate and delay. By bunging our system up with so many submissions, that slows everything down. But we're wise to their ways. 
The minister has personal reasons for his stand. My father, who was a doctor, he smoked, and unfortunately, at the age of 66, he got a stroke. My brother uh, was a doctor as well, but he couldn't kick the habit, and he died at 68 from lung cancer. So I have very personal experience of the consequence of smoking and what it means for families and the distress that it causes. Why are you going to introduce plain packaging, standard packaging? Because I believe firmly, as the Australians believe, that it will work. I've gone so far in the Parliament of this country to call this industry an evil industry, and I have been written to and told to desist. But I do struggle to find another term for an industry that seeks to addict young children to their product, knowing full well that one and two of them who become addicted are going to die as a consequence. To counter all the evidence from Australia and elsewhere, the industry repeatedly hammers one argument, that plain packaging will result in an avalanche of cheap smuggled cigarettes, both branded and counterfeit. It argues these illicit cigarettes will encourage people to smoke more, especially the young. Australia was the test bed for the industry's argument. We were just uh, about to approach a store which we believe um, some illegal cigarettes are being sold. BAT's spokesman, Scott McIntyre, is happy to show us how easy it is to buy smuggled cigarettes. BAT has hired a private security company and they have an undercover customer we'll call Angie. When Angie goes into the shop, what does she ask for? What have you got that's under $10 or what's your cheapest brand? And she'll buy a couple of cartons and um, hopefully we see her come out of the, uh, this shop, which is just around the corner, um, with a bag full of uh, illegal product. BAT do 3,000 covert purchases every year. She found that she's been successful. We followed Angie to three more shops. In two of them, she struck lucky. Yeah, something in the bag. It's not surprising that Angie's shopping trip was successful because BAT had checked out the stores first and established that illegal cigarettes were being sold. But how typical that is of stores across Australia is open to question. BAT claims that plain packaging has increased illicit tobacco smuggling by around a third. But there is a supreme irony. In the past, the tobacco industry has been accused by officials of increasing smuggling by flooding some markets with more cigarettes than they could possibly sell. So inevitably, their branded cigarettes ended up in the black market. I don't think that we can just take their assertions at face value. This is an industry who made assertions for decades after decades that there was no health risk to smoking when they knew that there was why we should then believe their claims about counterfeit tobacco is a big question the industry does not always tell the truth and their claims should be considered very skeptically it's impossible to get perfect data on smuggling as it's illegal but there is hard evidence from australian customs and it could have crucial implications for the uk most illicit cigarettes are smuggled in huge containers like these. X-rays may reveal any shipments of smuggled cigarettes. So what we've got here is the equivalent of approximately 10 million illicit cigarettes that have been seized by Customs and Border Protection. All these came out of one 40-foot container. And when you see it for real, the scale of such a seizure takes your breath away. Quates to about 1.5 to 2 million Australian dollars of duty that's been evaded or attempted to be evaded. And these are from China? Yes. Never seen these before. <laughs> Cigarettes like these are sold on the streets for half price, 
Customs are seizing about 200 million illicit cigarettes a year. The question is, is the problem getting any worse? The tobacco industry say that the increase since the introduction of plain packaging has been dramatic. Would you describe the increase as being dramatic? No, I wouldn't describe the increase as being dramatic as such, and I wouldn't describe it as being related to plain packaging at all. So what of the industry's claim that plain packaged products would be much easier to counterfeit? Customs have seized around 120 shipments since the new law came into force. Only one contained plain packaged cigarettes. But the industry insists that illicit tobacco is rising sharply and has now reached almost 14% of the total market. The Cancer Council of Victoria say that smuggling is round about 1% to 2%, no more than that. There's a huge discrepancy from the amount that you're claiming. Well, our, our figures actually show the same trend that the custom figures show, that they're going up. And no, wait a minute, wait a minute. The customs say there has been an increase, but the increase has been small. You're saying the increase has been considerable, this has been great. Customs aren't saying that. Well, customs only scan less than 5% of all containers that come through the, uh, the, the, the docks of Sydney. The industry's claim is based on a study they commissioned the consultants KPMG to do. A crucial part of the data is based on people searching for discarded packs in the street and in bins, and then analysing what percentage is smuggled. That seems to be hardly the most scientific way of collecting your data. It is it's laid out there in the report. I think there's a couple of pages on the methodology. Um, we use KPMG because they are regarded as the world's um, number one at these types of reports. The industry has commissioned research on smuggling and plain packaging from a whole range of consultants. They would argue that they do their research. They do it scientifically. Do you accept that? As an academic researcher, I beg to differ. I mean, I think quite a lot of the research that the tobacco industries f fund is rubbish. Um, it's, it uses weak research methods, um, inadequate sample sizes. Um, they um, have questions that are leading. Uh, and I am not convinced by any of it. British American Tobacco and KPMG told us they have complete confidence in their research and stand by it. Despite all of Australia's efforts, thousands of young people are still lighting up. But perhaps surprisingly, few of the champions of smoking we spoke to were keen on the habit themselves. Do you smoke? No, I don't, Peter. Why don't you smoke? Because uh, it's obviously very harmful to your health. And as a young person growing up in Australia, um, I learnt uh, from a very early age that it, it can do very serious health damage to you, it can possibly kill you, so I choose not to smoke. But that doesn't mean that other Australians shouldn't have the right to be able to do that, knowing the risks as adults over the age of 18. In the UK, the industry is now resorting to exactly the same arguments against plain packaging as it's still deploying so vociferously in Australia, with warnings of a smuggling Armageddon. We went to the northwest of England to try and find out how big a problem smuggling is in the UK. Training standards. We've got reason to believe that you're selling illicit tobacco at the premise. The fact that we've just... We followed a trading standards team supported by the police as they raided a small shop. Yeah, he's specifically putting his nose there. This is the third time this shop has been raided. The last couple of times the owner was fined, but clearly not enough to deter him. No, oh, goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. So you've found what you're looking for? We're winning. BAT claims that smuggled cigarettes are 16% of the total UK market. But as in Australia, those figures are hotly contested. It's a measure of the importance of the smuggling argument to BAT that it signed up Northern Ireland's former chief constable as a consultant. Well, in the UK, the scale is reckoned to be, in this I would say is a conservative estimate, a loss to the UK exchequer of more than £8 million a day. Interestingly, that amounts to just over £3 billion annually. And indeed, 
when you consider that, in addition to what these criminals use those profits for in all sorts of other areas of criminality, be it human trafficking, terrorism, money laundering, I think it's a very significant global problem. The Trading Standards team eventually hit the jackpot. Yeah. yeah. Hidden away, they found around £7,000 worth of illicit cigarettes. Some are probably counterfeit, but most are genuine brands smuggled in without duty being paid. In addition, there are brands like Jinling, manufactured legally in Russia with a view to being smuggled. And roughly, what would these uh, Marlboros be selling at? About £3.50 a pack. Just under half price? Yeah. Trading standards say their hard work is paying off and the industry is simply scaremongering. Ten years ago, something like 18% of the market was illicit. We've reduced that considerably, so now it's about 9% of the market. The cigarette companies say that if plain packaging were to be introduced, all this would increase hugely. Yeah. Cigarette companies say uh, every time there's a change in uh, legislation, every time the duty on cigarettes is increased, uh, that there will be a huge increase in smuggling. Every year, for the last 10 years and more, the, there has been a consistent and substantial decrease in the illicit share of the cigarette market. In the end, the arguments come down to individuals and the choices they make. Brian Jackson has given up smoking, but it's now too late. I can't walk really more than 100 yards without being very much out of breath. I can't go outside if it's, if it's cold. If there's a cold wind or it's, if it's raining, that really does get to my lungs. You're 62. What does the future hold, given your condition? I try not to look too far into the future, but I think I've got to be realistic and be fully aware that most probably I won't make it to 70. I'd be very surprised if I did. Very surprised. How do you see the future? Well, I don't really know. I don't know whether I've got one. I'm hoping I have, but I don't know. I know one thing, I'm not having another fag, put it that way. <laughs> There's no way I'm having another cigarette now. No way. Will you apologise for the tens of thousands of smokers who have suffered as a result of smoking cigarettes? Our job is to make sure people are informed of the risks of smoking. Consumers there afterwards will make a choice based on those risks whether they smoke or not. We actually say on our website that the only safe way is to quit. Do you smoke? I do smoke, yes. Do your children smoke? They're far too young. Would you like your children to smoke? I'd rather they didn't. Around the world, the battle continues and the anti-tobacco lobby is already thinking of where to strike next. We always have to keep looking forward. You need to keep the momentum up, reducing the number of retail outlets, reducing access, more tax increases. The louder the tobacco industry scream, the more effective you know the measure's going to be. We need to think about smoking in public places and extending that's, those policies into areas where children go. How much would you like to see a packet of 20 cost? Three times what it costs now. And talking to smokers, many will say, if you made it £20 a pack, I'd stop smoking. But the industry now thinks it may be able to remove the stigma that has long been attached to its business. It's developing new ways of delivering nicotine that could save millions of lives. BAT calls its strategy harm reduction, based on its acceptance that conventional cigarettes kill. It's now developing a range of much safer products based on nicotine and not tobacco that produces the deadly carcinogens when burned. BAT's first electronic or e-cigarette is already on the market. 
I think this is a hugely important moment for the tobacco industry. I think that the future is about tobacco harm reduction. It's about providing a range of alternative nicotine products to consumers. Whilst conventional cigarettes will remain the mainstay of our business for a long time. BAT's factory in Germany is still producing around 200 million cigarettes a day. E-cigarettes may be a foretaste of the future, as we'll see in the next programme, but in the UK they're only a small part of the present. Critics say e-cigarettes are simply a smokescreen to divert attention from the massive harm that the majority of its business still causes. Aren't you trying to rebrand yourselves? British American Tobacco is committed to a progressive future. I think we are different because we are at the forefront of driving that tobacco harm reduction future. And I understand that we are indeed the problem. That is no reason for us not to be part of the solution. I find it remarkable to see how much the public stance of the tobacco industry, and BAT in particular, has changed. But the glaring paradox remains. How can an industry that openly admits its product kills over five million of its consumers every year carry on producing and marketing cigarettes? I think for a company that sells a product that kills half of its users and continues to promote that product around the world as widely as it possibly can, it's a public relations joke. It's far from a PR stunt. It's a very, very clear commercial intent. It's the right thing to do for society. It's the right thing to do commercially for our shareholders. British American Tobacco say that they are now committed to harm reduction. Now, when BAT stand up and say, you know, as of, say, two, three, five years from now, we're going to stop selling cigarettes because we're a socially responsible company, I'll believe them. Next time, we investigate how the industry is hooking millions of new smokers in the developing world. How cigarette companies exploit loopholes to get round advertising bans. And how the industry hopes e-cigarettes will safeguard its future.